So my name is Fernando. I work for Entities Open Source Software Center, where I'm leading the kernel team and also the KBM team. And today, well, I would like to tell you about, I mean, all the trouble and all the issues we had with the existing uh, file system freeze API. So what's file system freeze? Uh, basically, it's the capability of suspending rights to your file system and putting that file system in a consistent state. And by cons consistent state, I mean a state uh, such as if we create a copy of, of that file system, we can actually mount it and access the data that is there. And the, all the metadata reflects what's on disk. And the most common use case for this feature is storage backups. The reason being that first and freeze allows you to create storage snapshots that are consistent at the file system level. And how is this implemented in Linux? Well, there are two APIs, one which is accessible from user space, and it's implemented using two IOCTLs. One is FI freeze, which is used to freeze the file system, and the other is FI4, which is used to unfreeze it. And then there's another API, which is access accessible only from inside the kernel and from kernel modules, which is implemented at the block device level. So it seems this is not accessible to users. I will not talk about this one in, in detail. So how does it look like internally? OK, so let's assume that you want to create a backup of your file systems. The first thing that you need to do is to execute the FI freeze IOCTL. Once you do that, all new writes to the file system will be suspended. The kernel will do that for you. So if a process, let's say, uses the write system call, that process will be put to sleep. And not only that, uh, all the dirty pages that hasn't been you know, written back to disk will be written back to disk. And in some cases, I mean, for example, if you use uh, for instance, such as XFS or ext4, uh, which has a journal, uh, in such cases, we call first thing specific uh, callbacks so that we can put a mark in the JVD or in the journal so that if something, so that if the system breaks or dies while the first thing is, you know, frozen, you can actually recover your file system. And so once we stop all new writes and write back all the data to the storage, we can create a snapshot or the backup and, and we know that we will be able to use it because the system was in a consistent state when we created that snapshot. And once we are finished, we have to call the FI4 IOCTL to resume writes. And it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple, but there are a lot of bugs and limitations that I will tell you about now. The first limitation or the first problem is that these days you can freeze a file system and unmount it just after that. But what happens if you unmount a frozen file system? Let's assume that after unmounting that, you know, that frozen file system, you want to unfreeze it. The problem is that to unfreeze it, you need a file descriptor that refers to a file in the file system that you are trying to unfreeze. But the first thing has been just unmounted, so it's not accessible. So there's no way for you to unfreeze the file system. You're stuck with with a frozen, unmounted file system. In other words, the super block inside the kernel is still alive, you know? So, sorry, 
sorry for interrupting. So, but uh, if any processes are still using the uh, file system, it's kind of frozen, but there is a usage of that. So, how actually the arm mounting is happening? Then? Ah, it, okay, the thing is that when there are no users? Yeah. For whatever reason? Okay, if there, is, if there are no users. Or, uh, or you can do a lazy arm mount. Even if there are users, you can always do a lazy arm mount. It will succeed even if there are users. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So if you do a you know, regular unmount without users, or do a lazy unmount with users, you're stuck with the frozen post system. Mm -hmm. and if you want to get out of that situation, you have to mount the false system again. But if you do that, you will, you will be right into this. For example, XFS and EXT4 update some data in this unit mount. But the thing is supposed to be frozen. Yeah. <laughs> there are several ways to fix this. A possible approach is not allowing users to you know, unmount frozen file systems. This looks reasonable, but if you do that, if you do that you're breaking lazy amounts, which is not acceptable to the BFS maintainer. The other approach is adding a block level API to the file system. The problem with that is that not all file systems are block device based. And I think that some, the guys from Samsung grow some file systems that are not block device based. Is that correct? So in that case, you couldn't use such an API. So what I decided to do is to automatically fill file systems on U-mount. That's with the current API, that this is the only reasonable way to fix <coughs> this problem. Oh, sorry about that. It's like <laughs> the, the problem with the current API is that there's no no check API. So there's no reliable way to know whether first thing is frozen or not. So you have to keep track of, of the first thing state yourself. Maybe you made a mistake, I don't know, using bash, you know, and, and ended up freezing several file systems. There's no way for you to know what happened. You can freeze the first thing and unfreeze it. Well, <laughs> but you cannot check what the current state is. This is, I mean, quite easy to fix. And I posted patches that added a new IOCTL to check the first and freeze state. And also added a, a patch, you know, to export the freeze count through mount info, which is a file in the proc first in the proc fest. Okay, more fun. Uh, this is, in my opinion, this is really cool. The thing is that, I don't know if you're familiar with the hand task watchdog. Are you familiar with it? The thing is that if a, a process gets stuck in an uninterruptible state for more than several seconds, the, the kernel will assume that something went awry and that the kernel should be, you know, panic, or the kernel should loops, you know? And the thing is that when we freeze the file system, or in other words, after freezing the file system, if a process tries to do a write, that will probably be suspended. In other words, that process that attempted a write will be put to sleep and it's going to be in an uninterruptible sleep. So the hand task watchdog will assume that that task is dead. That for some reason, the, the CPU scheduler is not scheduling that task. Or we assume that that task is waiting for, you know, in the scarcity request to finish or to complete. But it's not finishing. So Depending on your settings, of, you know, of, the, of your system, that watchdog will 
panic your your canal. And and the thing is that that task is just waiting for the administrator to you know call the fault or unfreeze IOCTL. So if you do it by hand, let, let's say that you first the first thing using this IOCTL and then go and have a cup of coffee or a cup of coffee or whatever and you forget about this IOCTL, you may end up with a bro with a you know with a system which is panic unusable. So what I did to fix this is give a hint to the hunt task watchdog. So I just add a flag to task extract so that the hunt task watchdog can look at the processes that are you know waiting for the first thing unfreeze and we check that flag and if the flag is set the watch will know that everything is okay and, and there's no need to, you know, to panic the system. Okay, as I mentioned before, there are two different first and first APIs. One which is accessible from user space and the other which is only for in kernel users. And for VDEP is the in kernel API. And these days it's being used by both XFS and device mapper code. So when we use DM snapshot, DM snapshot will try to freeze the first thing that sits on top of the DM device. But the thing is that in some cases uh, you have file systems that are multi disk, such as ButterFS. With ButterFS, you can build your array system at the first layer. And the thing is that if you do that, there's no way uh, for device mapper to know that what's sitting on, on top of the device mapper is ButterFS. And the reason for that is that traditionally, for example, ext 4 keeps a pointer to, to the device that it's using in the super block structure. That's okay for ext 3 and ext 4 because they, are, they can use only one disk at a time, right? But ButterFS should, my would need a list of pointers to, you know, to keep track of all the devices that it's using. But that, there's no such a list. So there's no way for the device mapper code to get that information. So in, in that case, if you create a snapshot using DM snapshot, and ButterFS is the first thing that is sitting on top, the chances are that you will not be able to mount the snapshot that you created. So you create a snapshot, which is unusable. And to fix this issue, what I did is modify and the ButterFS code so that we keep a pointer to the ButterFS super block in struct block device. <laughs> and another funny thing is, I mean, is when you try to use first and freeze inside and user namespace. The reason being that the current first and first code is not namespace aware. So in some cases, you, for example, let's assume that you freeze a file system from inside a container, and the root container is using that file system too. So you may end up hanging processes that belong to the root container which breaks isolation. So, in my opinion, this is a security problem. It hasn't been addressed yet. I'm working on patches to fix this, but I still haven't you know, had time to, uh, sub to send them to the FS Devel mailing list, but I will. <laughs> 
we have a public cloud and this is a really big issue for us. <laughs> okay, so now let me talk about uh, the cloud or virtualization use case for a while. I mean, companies like NTT that have you know, public clouds, some that want to, for the customer, they want to provide you know, automatic backups you know, for, the, for the customers. They can get money from, <laughs> You can get more money from your customers if you provide that kind of features, you know? So, and we've been providing such features for a few years, but the thing is that what happened sometimes is that, okay, you created the backup for the user and your user wanted to use that, that backup. But what would happen sometimes is that they will, would not be able to mount you know, the backup image. And the reason was that we were not taking care of the guest's file system state. We were not freezing the guests' file systems, so we were taking, we were creating a snapshot or a back or a backup while the guest is doing writes. So we ended up, you know, creating a snapshot of a file system that wasn't in a consistent <coughs> state. And if you want to fix that, you need some kind of, you know, cooperation from the guest which means that you need to run a guest agent inside the guests. These days in, K in KDM we have something which is called PMU agent, and that's what we are using these days. So what the cloud provider would do is access you know, that guest agent and ask the guest agent to freeze the file system for us. One, and after doing that, we can actually create the backup image, and we, we, we know that we, we will be able to actually use it. <laughs> this looks simple, but as I mentioned before, we have no check API. What happens if what happens if the guest uh, agent? Yeah crashes or dies after freezing the guest file system. Okay, so let's say that I'm the cloud provider. I froze my, you know, the guest file system through the guest agent, but the guest agent dies, crashes for whatever reason. Our customer will end up with a frozen file system. And the thing is that our user didn't know that, you know, that we froze <laughs> his or her file system. So our customers end up with hung systems. And the funny thing is that, is that even if there was a way to, you know, reboot or, you know, restart the guest agent, the guest agent has a way to check the state of the file system to, you know, to actually I'm freezing. <laughs> so, with the current API, we cannot provide that kind of you know automatic backup services to our customers. It's not safe because there's no check API. Okay. So, and what we did to address this issue is created a new first and a new first and first API from scratch. So the way it works is that when you want to freeze a file system, you use a new ILCTL which is called get freeze FD, which gives you a file descriptor. As long as you keep that file descriptor open, the first step will remain, you know, in a frozen state. And for example, let's assume that the guest agent uses this new API. So the guest agent using this API gets that file descriptor and keeps it open. And 
let's assume that for whatever reason the gist agent dies. When the gist agent dies, the kernel, the, the, the guest's kernel will close that file descriptor for you automatically. Because as part of the when you when you know when you process dies or is killed, all the file descriptors are closed automatically by the kernel for you. And since the kernel uh, will close this file descriptor as part of the cleanup, you know, for the process that is dying, the file will get unfreeze automatically. So there's no problem. Even if the guest agent dies, we know the, that the file system will get, you know, unfreeze. And the whole problem disappears, goes away. And th there's, there are some uh, several other issues that we are working on. And well, the first one is, is that I'm trying to get my patches, you know, merged upstream. It's a pretty big patch set. I've been sending patches for something like two or three years. But the BFS maintainer, Albiro, is really busy and didn't have time to, you know, <laughs> pick my patches. But I already got, you know, act buys and rebuild buys from the access maintainer and the XT4 maintainer and several other guys. Hopefully, by the end of the year, my patches will be upstream. And another thing I'm working on is BSS support. BSS support stands for Volume Shadow Copy Service, which is a Windows API, um, which works in such a way that when you try to freeze the file system, but before actually freeze the file system, you send on a notification to the applications so that they can write or whatever data they want to write back to disk. This is useful for databases such as Oracle or MySQL that may want to write all their you know, internal buffers to disk before freezing the file system. So that the first thing is consistent not only at the first time level but also at the application, at the application level. Some people want, want both. There are some databases such as PostgreSQL that they have that do their own, you know, journaling. So, being you know, uh, log replay, they can you know recover from even if something crashes or or if you take a snapshot without notifying PostgreSQL. PostgreSQL is capable of detecting uh, the fact that something happened. You know, without being notified. But that doesn't apply to uh, MySQL and some Oracle databases. So for Oracle and MySQL and this kind of feature I think would be cool. And but some maintainers in the kernel community don't like it because it's I don't know, maybe because it's something that comes from Microsoft. But, but we have some customers that would like to have this app. Mm. Even if it's not accepted upstream, we would be willing to, you know, main, maintain the parts ourselves. So. And that's it. Do you find this interesting, or maybe I don't know. Do you have a first background? He does, right? Yeah, just you. Well, yes, I, I have so long. So. <laughs> yeah. I came here because from a more sysadmin perspective, mm -hmm. working in some internal uh, storage and building some internal storage file for a uh, distributed one using the uh, whatever is provided. You know, so it's it distributes a different level over the whatever you're doing. Uh, so anything which is file system is interesting for me, and I, I found you know generally I think it's some kind of gulf between kernel and Linux yeah. hardcore uh, community and people. You know, yeah. since that mean there's some kind of misunderstanding I and I not am. not following. And I found you know so, so <laughs> some things I might be hit in the future about you know there's I'll be aware that if I ever decided to have some of these phrases 
what kind of problem I might may be hit. Especially if you try to in the cloud, you have to be careful. Yeah, yes, um, as a, the, the virtualization use case is really, I mean, it's really useful, but it's really broken. So <laughs> if I were you, I, I would pick these patches and... <laughs> I don't need providing you know, with this. Need I'm working with the community, so I mean, hopefully by the end of the year, everything will be upstream and backported to RHEL 7 or RHEL 6.5 or SUSE and everything. We are not quite there yet. <laughs> but, but how is it solved now? It's broken. It's broken. Yeah. That's why Red Hat wasn't providing support for this feature, even though it was part of the kernel. I mean, these IOS CTLs can be used, you know, in Grail 6.4 and 6.3 and 5.9, is that the latest version? The IOS CTLs are there, but Rahab is, will, is not providing support for it. It's like, I think they call it the technology preview, I think that's the name. So, so the API is there, but you see, I mean, if you want to use it, go ahead, but we won't help you if something breaks, you know? So, so, so as I understand that, uh, for example, if the virtual machine is doing snapshot, it fully relies on the agent running inside. Yes. It's, it's for anything like for Windows Linux, which is running inside the virtual machine. How do you so, so what, for example, if I make a snapshot of my Ubuntu running in the key, we will throw. Okay, no, the, the problem is it happens when the guest agent dies. When the guest, but if I don't have any guest, the issue is there. And you don't have no guest, okay, no, no guest agent, no, yeah, nothing. Nothing. And you take, you create a snapshot from the host. Yeah. You, okay, you may end up with a backup image that you cannot mount. Uh, okay. That happened to us. <laughs> Especially if the guest is not using right barriers mm -hmm. for you know their file systems, chances are that you will not be able to mount the snapshot or backup image that you created. It is a lot of fun, or it's not. But <laughs> really, our customers were really pissed off, so that's why <laughs> I decided to fix this. So what do you think about? So I just wanted to let you know that maybe, oh, the 
the projector is really. So did you find this kind of issues with the hand task watch though? Um, yes. So you're, you are using a flag to mark the processes that, um, that no, you want to use? I just accept the problem. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to deploy anything real. Most of the work I do is in a lab, so. Okay, so, okay, okay. <laughs> it is frustrating though. <laughs> Yeah, it was frustrating, I mean, you know, for our customers. You didn't like it. <laughs> okay, that takes it. <laughs> so maybe it's like, you know, speeding up, upstreaming things by some uh, social uh, technology, you know, going to sysadmin and show me, you know, you have this feature, your customers might be pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> Your boss might fire you because you said it. <laughs> because you said <laughs> And you know, the, there will be some, you know, demand on things like Red Hat, you know, why it's not working, you know, because if somebody you know, potential can work, it's, yeah. it's, it's adding the pressure. The thing is that, I mean, I talked about this issue at the current summit a few years back. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I don't um, they don't really care about this. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's broken. We'll fix it. But well, I fixed it for them. You know, it's done. <laughs> but it's like books. I find I try to learn more because we are. You have you have a lot of IO and so I yeah. you know going for some kernel kernel books, but they are written for developers. Okay, it's interesting that you have like C code. What happened yeah. when you? the new process but it's for I mean, it's not very useful. It's like ten sentences in the beginning of the chapter, making some description which might be useful to, to me and to tell my developers, you know, Java developers, okay, it's not worth it doing like read. Fine. No, it's wrong. If you can write and not read, it's like that. But it's it, there is this 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 this, uh, this you know, people doing something you know for kernel yeah. and there is People which are using them, and you know, okay. so it might be that if you show to others, you no know, less to develop uh, to kernel developers, more to the people like DevOps, which you know might hit yeah. this problem. They might be more interesting to investigate and ask, mm -hmm. you know, how it happened, uh, why. Yeah. But well, do you care about the uh, namespace use case the, for for? The, mm. Do you care about the user namespaces or not really containers? What do you think? Let's see if you have a container which is in hosted, which is also they're being used by the root container. <coughs> How should first of all behave? Do you have any ideas? Uh, should we allow containers to be first of all to begin with? I don't think so. So it's okay. <laughs> That's my thought. Uh, that's what I thought. I mean, it's just things get really complicated, and I mean, you end up having to free just part of your whole system, you know, just just this directory, and but not the other part. And but, uh, but in some cases, you cannot do that because you have a journal, a journal, and there are dependencies, and it's a mess. <coughs> so I don't know, maybe I should. Maybe what we should do is uh, modify the DFS so that we know we don't allow the containers to use this API and just return mm -hmm. uh, EDC or whatever, I don't know, E something. <laughs> e not supported or. I don't know. Um, what would happen in the like, virtual machine level when you try to phrase something? From inside, I guess. Let's say yes. Because you mentioned KVM, do you mean container as like a light wave container or like KVM machine is also container? I'm talking about KVM, sorry, I should have mentioned that. Yeah. So it's a like it's usual KDM. machine, it's not like a virtual machine, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so I see that there, there might be a problem for mm -hmm. yes. people. Absolutely. OpenVZ and Alexi. And because if you want to have two virtual machine running on one, and you can somehow. Yes. <laughs> in spaces, I imagine if you have a 
It's like an essay or armor, things like yeah. that. You don't want to. So, <laughs> so there are possible approaches of allowing you know, this, this API from inside from the end. That's a possible approach. Right? I still think about it. So you have any ideas just to let me know. <laughs> If you know Abira, please tell him to take me. My heart just didn't answer. Any questions? Or? Okay. Great, thank you.